So what is the bandwidth of a digital clock waveform? And how does it affect circuit design in digital circuits and computers? So here we have a clock waveform going from minus one to plus one at a certain rate. And we notice that the period in this case is capital T. So how do we find out the bandwidth of this waveform? Well, we know something about the bandwidth of this waveform from our Fourier transforms. And we know that the Fourier transform of this waveform here, which is zero everywhere except for this square pulse, has a sink shape. And for more details on this, uh, check out the video in the description below this video. There's a link for the relationship between the rect function, the square function, and the sync function in the Fourier domain. And what we can see is here the relationship here. I've drawn just the positive pulse from over here, and it is of width t divided by 2. It goes from minus t on 4 to t on 4. And in the frequency domain, in omega, the radial frequency, this occupies a bandwidth that actually goes to infinity because of the sync function. Most of the energy is in this main lobe between a frequency of minus 4 pi on t and 4 pi on t. Now let's understand a lot more about what that means practically for our circuit design. And let's think about this clock waveform. Well, this clock waveform is a periodic waveform. This one was aperiodic. So for periodic waveforms, we know that we need to work out the Fourier series. And the Fourier transform is related to the Fourier series. So here's the Fourier series equation, and here's the Fourier transform, which includes the Fourier coefficients AK, according to this formula here. Uh, and so uh, because it's periodic, we know that the Fourier transform is going to be made up of a series of delta functions. It's not going to be like this function over here, which is has all the different frequency components. This is only going to have frequency components where there are delta functions. And again, for more information on the Fourier transforms of periodic signals and aperiodic signals, there's a video in the link below. So let's uh, evaluate this and think of how we're going to do that. So this means we have to integrate over a period capital T. And when we look at this waveform here, it's a bit difficult to do that. I mean, we can do it, but it, how do we get a nice expression from it? Well, there's a slight mathematical trick here. So instead of using this waveform, we're going to take a uh, modify this waveform, calculate that, and then relate it back to this waveform. So I'll just show you the trick here. Uh, instead, what we do is we add a constant to this waveform. So if we shift this entire waveform up, we can shift it up by one, for example, if we shift the entire waveform up, the only coefficient that we're affecting is A0, because A0 is the zero relates to the zero frequency. And the zero frequency is a constant waveform. So a constant waveform, which is constant for all time, is going to affect A0. It's not going to affect any of the other coefficients. Uh, so what we can do is we can add one to this, and then we can just subtract one off the value for A0. So if we add one to this and we look at think about which actual period we're going to integrate over, so instead of doing zero to capital T, it's easier and it gives a better expression uh, if we go from minus T on two to T on two. So I've drawn here what we're going to do. We're going to integrate over this period. We're going to integrate from minus T on two to T on two. So that's still over a period. And we're going to take this one and add one to it. So we get this function here. So it's zero here, then it goes up to two, and then it goes back to zero. And that's the integral, that's the period we're going to integrate over. Now I've written out the answer down the bottom here. Uh, I'm not going to go through it all here, but you can confirm for yourself that if you do this way, you get a nice expression for the Fourier coefficients in terms of a sine function divided by k pi. And you'll recognize this as a sinc function. Uh, and this is for a k, for k not equal to zero. Uh, for a zero, uh, what's that going to equal? Let's just think about that for a moment. Um, well, if we look at this waveform here, you can see straight away, just by looking at it, that a zero is going to equal zero. Why is that? Because again, a zero represents the non-changing DC offset constant component of the signal. And this signal here, is averaged around, I mean, it, it oscillates around zero and it goes forever. 
So the DC offset is zero. It's got equal amount of the signal above as below the zero line. So A0 will equal zero. But we can also convince ourselves of that. Well, here's the equation here. Uh, when K equals zero, this exponential function here uh, gives you one. So you're actually integrating just the value two. So for A0, you've got this integral of just the value two. Well, the two can come out the front and you've got two divided by capital T. So I'll just write that here, two divided by capital T. And you're left with an integral of just one, which is the value from the extreme. So t divided by four minus the minus, which gives you plus t divided by four, if you just do that integral. And then you've got this thing here. And then of course we need to subtract the one because we added one to our waveform to get this waveform here. So we have to subtract one to get the uh, a naught for the original waveform. Okay, so this cancels here, the t's cancel top and bottom, and the two, the one quarter plus one quarter equals a half, which is times two, and gives us, uh, sorry, gives us one minus one, which equals zero. So yes, we can confirm from the equation that we indeed get a zero equals zero, which is what we expected just from observation. Okay, so here's some formulas, and let's not spend too much time in the formulas, but let's work out and draw the function in the frequency domain. So now that we've got the Fourier transform over here in equation form, let's see it, draw it out, and answer the question of what is the bandwidth for the digital clock. Okay, so let's try to evaluate this here now. So we evaluate k equals zero. So we're gonna do each term in this summation and plot them over here. So for k equals zero, we know that a zero equals zero. So this equals zero when k equals zero. So that in this term here, the zeroth term gives you a zero value, so that's zero here. Uh, what about when k equals one? So if k equals one, there will be a delta function at k times omega naught. And what's omega naught? Well, that's the fundamental frequency that comes from the period of your waveform. So omega naught here equals two pi divided by capital T. Okay, so that's the fundamental frequency. So there will be, a, when k equals one in this summation, there'll be a delta function at omega naught, at two pi divided by capital T. So over here, we have two pi divided by capital T, and there'll be a delta function. Now, how high will that delta function be? Well, it will be of height A1. So if we look down here, A1 gives us sine of k equals one, so sine of pi on two. And we know I can do a little sketch here of sine of the sine function. And uh, just to remind ourselves, so if this is theta, then this is sine of theta. So if theta equals the value in the brackets here equals pi on two, so just uh, remind ourselves that's two pi, that's pi. So pi on two will equal equals one. So sine of pi on two equals one. So we've got one here. So we've got two divided by, when k equals one, two divided by pi times two pi, because we've got ak times two pi. So the height here is going to equal the value four. Okay, so this one here has a delta function at that value there where the height equals four. Okay, now what about when k equals two? So we do, we've got to do it for each of the elements of this sum. So when k equals two, we've got uh, some, they're going to be a delta function at twice this frequency here, twice the omega naught. Uh, so that's four pi on t. How high is it going to be? That's when a k equals two. So a k over here, we put k equals two in here. We've got sine of pi. Sine of pi equals zero. So there is no delta function there. It's a delta function multiplied by zero. Okay, so what about when k equals three? When k equals three, you've got a delta function at three times omega naught. So that's six pi divided by t, six pi divided by t. And the height of it will be a three. K equals three here. We've got sine of three pi on two, that equals minus one. We're gonna plot the magnitude here. So we're gonna be a positive one when we plot the magnitude. So we've got two thirds of pi times the two pi. So the height there equals four thirds. So we're gonna have a height here of four thirds. That's the height there, four divided by three. And so on, you can see the next one equals zero as well. And the next one equals, you can put that in here and you'll be able to see that it equals four fifths. So there'll be a delta function here 
of height 4 on 5, and th where this is 10 pi divided by t. And the same thing for the negative values as well. So there's a negative, uh, there's a delta functions at negatives of the same heights as the ones at the positive values. Okay, so there we, this is minus 2 pi on t, uh, minus 6 pi on t, and minus 10 pi on t. Okay, so now we've got the the, the um, Fourier transform of the clock, digital clock waveform. Here it is here. And just notice in comparison to this one above here, I've drawn them below each other deliberately, uh, because we can see, and we can see from this sync function here, that actually this is following a sync function that it matches with the sync function for this uh, one above. So we can see here, I'm just going to do it in dotted lines here, because it's sort of like the envelope. Uh, around these delta functions. The, the Fourier transform only exists at these delta functions. I'm just showing the dotted around the top here so that we can see the comparison with the Fourier transform of the signal, which was just the aperiodic signal, just this square wave. Okay, now what we can see here is when we have this ongoing periodic digital clock waveform, we're going to have components of the frequency at 2 pi on t. We're going to have other components which are a third as high at 6 pi on t, and other components which are a fifth as high at 10 pi on t. So the bandwidth, answering the question, the bandwidth of this clock signal is infinite, just as the bandwidth of this was infinite. But it only exists at certain, you only have these exact frequency components, but they do go forever. Now, importantly, how does this relate to digital circuit design, uh, where you have these digital clocks, uh, as we said at the start? Well, let's think about this for a minute. Uh, in a digital circuit, uh, with a let's say with a microprocessor, for example, you might be having the clock rate as, for example, 6 gigahertz. So a lot of clocks on computers and processors these days are at uh, in the gigahertz, let's say 6 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, let's pick 5 gigahertz. So what does that mean? Well that means 1 on t equals 5 gigahertz. And so what does uh, what does that mean? Well we've got that means we will have in our circuit when we have a clock oscillator uh, and then we're needing to feed that into the clock input on our microprocessor or in any other digital chip on our circuit board, uh, we're going to have wires on our circuit board which are transmitting the clock and they are going to have components on those wires at this frequency, which is, uh, this is radial frequency, so uh, this actually would be the 5 gigahertz uh, frequency here. You're also going to have it at 15 gigahertz and you're also going to have it at 25 gigahertz. So on those wires which are on your circuit board, which are running around the circuit board feeding all the different digital um, uh, chips which need those clocks, uh, you will be having wires which have components at 5 gigahertz, if it's a 5 gigahertz clock, but also 15 gigahertz, 25 gigahertz, and so on. And why is that important? Well, let's think about those wires and see if they're actually going to radiate that signal. So they'll carry the signal along the wire, but they might also act like an antenna. And we know that the uh, wavelength of a radiating antenna, it, they radiate fairly well at lambda divided by two. Okay, so if your frequency is lambda on two, uh, the, the length of your wire is lambda on two, then it can act like an antenna. And that means it can it can radiate to other wires on your circuit board and interfere on your circuit board. So in this case, let's say we know that lambda equals the speed of light divided by the frequency. So if you had, for example, uh, a, a waveform here, let's pick, uh, let's pick this, this waveform here. So if it was 5 gigahertz, then this frequency here would be 15 gigahertz. So let's pick that one. We're going to say 3 by 10 to the 8 divided by 15 by 10 to the 9. Uh, then this is going to equal uh, 0.02 meters. So that means 20 centimeters. And we've said that uh, we know that antennas radiate fairly effectively if they are if the wire is of length lambda on two. So if you have a wire on your circuit board which is 10 centimeters long, lambda on two, 10 centimeters long, then it is going to be a fairly effective radiator for these frequencies here. So if you have a clock at five gigahertz, then this component, which is only a third the 
amplitude, so there's still quite a significant component of this on that wire, that will be radiating as an antenna if your wire, if your uh, route on your circuit board is longer than 10 centimeters. So this is something where you really want to be, um, uh, sorry, not 20 centimeters, two centimeters. Sorry, that's uh, just getting an order of magnitude out here, two centimeters. So if you have a, a track which is one centimeter long, then it is going to be acting like an antenna for these components of your digital clock. And that is gonna cause you problems if you run that track very close to another track on your circuit board where you don't want it to be having the clock on that other track. It might be a data track, for example. So you have to be very careful about thinking about the length of your clock tracks on your circuit boards. And this is one of the reasons why we have the clock uh, circuits shielded with, mul with layers mul on multi-layer circuit boards with, uh, with shielding layers between the clock layer. So I hope this has given you more understanding of how a digital clock uh, has different frequency components and how they are, are discrete in the frequency domain uh, and how it relates to the design of circuit boards. If this is, video has been helpful, please give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Uh, check out the links in the description below the video and you'll find a web page there which has a full categorized li list of all the videos on the channel. And of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos.